Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Today we are talking to someone that um, I'm really excited to have on the show. Uh, someone who, without knowing, has played a huge role in my life and I'm very appreciative of uh, his time today. Jordan Cooper, who's the founder and owner of Revelation Records. Uh, since 1987, this iconic hardcore music label is known for releases by bands such as Youth of Today, Sick of It All, Chain of Strength, Judge, and Gorilla Biscuits. Revelation, or Rev, or R and the Star, uh, has an online store selling all their vinyl, merchandise, and the go-to place for anything punk and hardcore because it's also a, a major distribu distribution hub of independent music. So with that, Jordan, welcome to the show. Thanks. All right. So, uh, you know, in prepping for this conversation, one of the things that I, I loved, like when we first emailed and then also when we had a call, you seemed a little hesitant to, to get on here. And a lot of it was like, I don't know if like, Am I right for like a leadership podcast or a business podcast? And I really liked how humble you you are uh, right off the bat. And so I asked a friend of mine who's a friend of the show, Andrew Klein. I was like, hey, what's something fun I could ask Jordan about to start the conversation? He's like, ask him about pizza. He loves pizza. <laughs> so tell us about your love of pizza. Okay. Well, do you want the whole episode to go right now? Or? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I just, you know, grew up in the Northeast and... I, it, pizza was just there. You didn't have to think about it, thanks to waves of uh, so, uh, migration from southern Italy. We had great pizza everywhere. And uh, then when I moved here and I was vegan, it was hard. You know, first of all, I didn't have pizza for a while. And I just started making pizza at home. And then eventually I went and visited my family and walked across the street and got a slice of pizza. Or my brother got a slice of pizza. And I was like, let me just have a bite of that. I miss that stuff. And it was so good when I came back home, I was like, I'm not vegan anymore. I'm, I'm just going to eat pizza. No, nothing, no other dairy stuff or whatever. And so a pizzatarian. Uh, yeah, pizzatarian <laughs> almost. Um, but then there's also burritos now. I, you know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, it's California. The, uh, so it was hard to find good pizza in, in Huntington Beach at that time. So, you know, the first few places I went, I was like, it's pizza, but it's just, it's not good. And I was, I was just always like talking about, I wish I could find a good pizza place that, and I would describe it. And, um, uh, my girlfriend at the time worked, I don't know if it was Santa Monica, but there's a publishing company, BMG, mm -hmm. and they brought in lunch one day from, uh, this, the place that I'm going to go later, Mulberry street pizza. And, um, and she grew up in California, so she, but she, she had heard me complaining so much. She was like, I bet this is the pizza Jordan's talking about. This, this, this seems like what he is describing. <laughs> and, um, and she told me about it. And, you know, a few months later, somehow, you know, we tried it. And I was like, you know, first of all, you know, the people are from New York and, um, and it was perfect. And the funny story, you know, Larry and I have been there a million times. And um, on their 20th anniversary, they put out these pamphlets on the table about the restaurant. And, um, I, you know, I was reading it or Larry was reading it. And he's like, wait, didn't you grow up in Mayapac? And, and uh, I was like, yeah. And he's like, the owner is from Mayapac. So I grabbed the thing and I looked, looked through it. And he's like, his family was, you know, he's born in the Bronx. And then his family moved to this town, Mayapac. Mm -hmm. And that's my family story, and probably a lot of people from from the Bronx just moved north up into Putnam County. If you can't afford Westchester, you know Putnam's pretty good. Um, so anyway, the owner is has has eaten at the same went to the same high school as me, ate, ate at the same pizza place as me, and no surprise, he makes pizza exactly the way I like it. You know, which is um, sort of like you know an Americanized Neapolitan style. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I could go on for quite a while if, if you like. <laughs> well, first I want to say, like, it's the best start to any interview I've ever done. Cause like you spoke about pizza with the passion and intensity. And like the way you told the story was like, you were talking about your firstborn child. So like, well done. <laughs> but yeah, it's funny. That's the, one of the things that I was concerned about is like Ray and I have always talked about like, what, what I, he's got everything I lack. Like, you know, he's very um, conscious and passionate and I'm the opposite, you know? So it, it's hard to talk about leadership when, you know, I'm more of like, uh, 
water runs downhill kind of person, which I mentioned. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> and so for, for the uninitiated people who don't know, so if you're talking about Ray, you're talking about Ray, Ray Capo. Yeah, Ray Capo. Um, Youth of Today started Revelation Records with me and, you know, basically formed Revelation Records. Yeah. And so like uh, in the culture, and, and I, I know you and I talked about this, um, people come to this podcast from all sorts of different backgrounds. Like, um, you know, we've got people from the corporate world, people from social services, we pe people from the acting world, the arts, athletes, a lot of different people uh, come listen to the podcast. So some of them are going to know who Ray Capo is, but for the uninitiated, Ray Capo is like a, a really important figure even modern, uh, even in current times, um, in punk and hardcore, in terms of like what he brought to the table from bands like Youth of Today, bands like Shelter, Better Than a Thousand. And also it's just been like an interesting cat that has done a, a lot of cool things, some of, of which he got major heat for, but we'll talk all about all of that later. Uh, but the two of you have had a very close and longstanding relationship for many years. Yeah. And he has a, uh, he has a podcast wisdom of the sages, mm -hmm. which, you know, every time I hear, hear that it's, you know, I still, it brings me back to what drew me to Ray in, in the beginning. He's just, uh, has a way of communicating that, you know, it reaches me anyway. Yeah. And uh, obviously a lot of people. So where you grew <clears throat> up and sorry, was it Mayo Pack? Yeah. Okay. Uh, small town. Yeah. How did you find punk and hardcore? What was the first entry point? Um, that's kind of a recently kind of uncovered fun story for me because I never really thought too hard about it. But um, in an inter interview with Andrew Klein for his uh, zine that he did a few years ago, um, he asked me something that made me kind of trace the events. And um, Mayapak, in, is, Mayapak is a town that's roughly a half hour from Danbury, Connecticut, which is where Ray... Uh, is from. Both of my parents were teachers. My dad worked for a, a public school in New York. My mom uh, taught at some schools in New York and then eventually long term uh, taught at the school that Ray Capo's mom worked at also. So um, before Ray and I met, my mom worked with Ray's mom and they knew each other for years. Um, but so how I, I heard about hardcore from uh, friends in high school. They were in, they were into punk and hardcore when I was into classic rock. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, you know, they, they played it for me. It just, you know, I was like, I'm staying over here with Pink Floyd and yes, mm -hmm. you guys listen to that, but we're, we're still friends and we're still, you know, doing all the mischievous stuff that high school kids and, uh, rural towns do. Um, but they would, uh, one of the guys in Mayapak, Chris Giggler would, was um, listening to, and probably all of them listened to this show on K on WXCI, which was from the school that our Ray and, and my mom, Ray's mom and my mom worked at. It was a high school radio show? No, it was a college, okay. uh, West Western Connecticut State College at the time, university now, um, college radio station. Um, and Ray had a show on there and if it was called like something jukebox um, and Daryl Ort and Ray did the, did a rate. I thought it was Daryl Ort's show and Ray helped DJ sometimes, but um, Chris, Chris and his friends would, you know, somehow like tilt the radios just the right way on, on a certain time. And I don't know how they found out about it, but they listened to this show. And, and so they were, they were telling me like, we like punk, but there's this kind of punk called hardcore that, you know, you're going to love, you know, it's, it's, it's way better. It's way, way faster. I don't know what they said, but that was what they really loved. And, you know, I just, it, it, what, you know, I just, uh, the way hardcore was presented to me by other people in my school, um, it just didn't appeal to me because it was like, isn't this funny? Isn't this crazy? Mm -hmm. Um, and for whatever reason at the time I was like, you know, music should be serious is the way I was thinking. My family moved to, Danbury so my mom could be closer to her work um, my father had died you know a few years earlier and so there's no reason to stay where we were and um, so we moved to Connecticut and in high school I met Ray and he was not um, content with me just like not listening to her you know like <laughs> you can't know about hardcore and not love hardcore. Let me explain. Let me tell it. Let me play you the stuff that is going to convert you. And he, you know, he, 
I still, to this day, I don't know if I became a fan of Ray enough to like hardcore or if he just played the, the right music for me. But anyway, I became a, a devotee of both or a fan of both, you know? So <clears throat> when you were younger and you were listening to like, you know, Yes and, and all those bands, were you into music or was it just like, oh yeah, you listen to music? I, I don't, I think in general, music was a, you know, at that time in that environment, I think music was part of your identity, even if you weren't into punk, at least for a lot of people, like maybe if you were into sports or whatever, um, what were the, there was kept freaks, geeks, and, you know, we had burnouts and jocks and there's, a, and, and nerds, you know, that was our, that was our, the three divisions in our high school. But, it, you know, if you had something in your life, um, other than music, maybe that was what you were into. But for, for my friends and I, it was pretty much music and, you know, maybe a little bit cars and, you know, typical redneck stuff. Yeah. Were you into skateboarding? Not until I met Ray. Okay. I mean, I had a skateboard when I was in junior high and we, you know, we just, we lived in cold mount, you know, mountainy environment. There were, skateboarding was not, you could ride down a hill and kill yourself. Mm -hmm. So most of the stuff we did on a skateboard was just kind of messing around. Right. Um, you know, two people sit on the skateboard and go down the hill and, you know, hopefully you don't lose too much skin at the end and you know, that kind of thing. So you and Ray uh, meet and it's life changing eventually. Yeah. You know, you've talked to me a bit about, and I've also read in uh, zines and uh, in books that you've been, uh, a book you were interviewed in about that relationship um, and what it's meant to you. But for, if you were to just take a guess, like what you found in Ray is like, you articulated pretty well. What did Ray find in you? Um, I, I mean, I don't know, I, you know, everybody ha finds a way to c connect and raise, I think silliness, like humor and, and, uh, was our, like the, the, the bottom, you know, the foundation of our friendship. Like we both could look at a situation and find the humor and, and Ray can do that with anybody. I don't know if you know him well, but you know, if you, if you're just hanging around with him one-on-one, -on -one, he is very good at. Uh, finding your point of like finding your thought and sh like understanding it and like enjoying it, you know, like he's a great communicator, I think, mm -hmm. um, and a, a great listener. Mm -hmm. And I think that was uh, one of the things that uh, clicked for me. But I think he he's pretty good at make he, everybody is like considers Ray their best friend, but he's got a million best friends. And I've kind of always been drawn to people like that, like these hub type people mm -hmm. and you know it's you know it's a win-lose because it's sort of it can be one-sided and then often you'll you know I've noticed throughout my life like I, I introduced two people that I consider like my this is my my best friend and interview my uh, you know introduce them to to my other really close friend and then like all of a sudden they're you know better friends because oh, yeah. they're just you know more awake uh you know conscious people and that's just the way things go. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that, I, I think that answers the question. So uh, this may surprise you. I've never met Ray Capo. Uh, oh, you got to have him on here. Well, I yes. Uh, I can I just tell you about my brush with Ray Capo. Okay. <laughs> he unintentionally stole my donuts. I was at a music fest that uh, Youth of Today was playing, and I was on one side of the pit, and my donuts were on the other side of the pit, being held by my dear friend, one of my closest friends, Trey. And Trey sends me a text. He's like, hey, man, I got your donut. I got donuts for you, at the, you know, from the place, vegan donuts. And I was like, I love donuts. I was like, I can't, I can't wait. I get to watch Youth of the Day, and then I get to have vegan donuts. I'm, this is perfect. This is great. I'm watching Youth of the Day, played a great set. It was before they reunited with Walter and Sammy. So it was a, a, definitely a cool show, but I haven't seen them with Walter and Sammy yet, which I'm very excited to see at some point. Anyways, they're great. They're awesome. After the show, I ended up, engaged like doing a couple of things i didn't get a chance to go over and uh i send trey a text i was like hey i'll be over to get my donuts and he's like sorry they're gone good story and i was like what <laughs> so i march <laughs> i march over and i thought trey just ate my donuts and he's laughing as i come up and i was like 
why are you laughing? What did you do? And he was like, it's not what I did. It's what Ray Capo did. He's like, Ray Capo came up to say hello. And I had this box of donuts. And I said, hey, Ray, would you like a donut? Because I thought you'd like Ray to have a donut. I was like, of course I'd want Ray to have a donut. And he's like, well, Ray instantly went, hey, kids, donuts, and invited his flock of children to come over. And they took all of the donuts. <laughs> and I was like, why didn't you stop them? He's like, I'm not going to say no to a kid who wants a donut. Yeah. And I was like, Capo, you <laughs> stole my donuts. At least I owe him for all the all the great things he's done for us culturally. But that's been my only interaction with Ray Capo. Uh, I look forward to having him on the show. But let's go back to you, man. Um, but yeah, Ray, Ray, losing food or clothes to Ray is probably not, uh, you're not alone, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually have collected a few other donut stories about Ray Capo. When I tell this story, wow. I've had a couple of <laughs> people be like, actually, I have a donut story about Ray Capo too. Amazing. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's go back to you though, man. So you get into this this space with, with Ray and you're learning about this scene. A lot of people get into punk and hardcore because something's missing in their life or something happened in their life. So like, as I told you, when I was young, like I was bullied a lot when I was a kid, I, uh, my parents, uh, come from an ethnically mixed marriage. My father's Armenian, my mom's Irish. Like there's a lot of cultural differences created a lot of like chaos in their family, uh, um, circle. And then like where I grew up, I grew up in Calgary where it's like, nobody's named a Ram. So like I grew up people calling my family like terrorists and like we bullied a ton. So skateboarding became like part of my identity from skateboarding came punk and hardcore. That's how I got into it. And that's why I think it's had such a, like a meaningful place in my life. It's been like kind of an anchor for me for better or for worse. Cause there's a lot of, there's so many good things and there's a lot of negative things too, that can be associated with it. Did punk and hardcore like feel something for you or was it simply just like a social activity with your friends? Um, well, I guess both, um, you know, like a lot of kids, you know, you have anger and, you know, depending on your personality type, your anger gets expressed or, or released in, um, healthy or unhealthy ways. So hardcore is very useful for, you know, expressing aggression and anger and that kind of emotion. But also, yeah, I, uh, I was um, a new kid in a big high school in my senior year, having had kind of a rough several years prior to that, you know, I um, went to four different high schools. Um, and being a senior at, at Danbury High, I was like pretty isolated, like friends from my neighborhood and, um, you know, didn't really relate totally to them. There was you know, fairly segregated high school and Ray just sort of, um, was good at finding people who, you know, needed help or were adrift. And I think he just, you know, saw an anarchy symbol on my book and was like, uh, uh this, this guy's mine now. You know, <laughs> he just sort of brought me to the anthrax and was, you know, introduced me to everyone. And, and that was, so it was, not just like social, it was, um, it was, was kind of like lifted me out of a uh, several year um, funk I was in and really kind of changed the direction of my life, kind of um, almost back to where, you know, where I might have been when I was 11 or something, you know, definitely more um, confidence and all that. So he, he kind of let you, he kind of helped you do a reset to like an earlier time in your life. Like yeah. Finding yourself again. Uh-huh. And maybe not so much myself, but like a new, maybe a new identity. Moving to Danbury was, was, even though I was on board with the concept, when it actually happened, I was um, just, you know, make your way in a new school. Mm -hmm. um, so the anthrax, and again, for the, for people who wouldn't have the history on punk and hardcore, this is very, at least famous to us. Uh, punk club in Connecticut. So Ray takes you to the anthrax, introduces to everyone. So who do you meet in that? Like, and, and you're like, any name, it matters. It doesn't matter if it's like a historical name, but who was your, who were the core people that he introduced you to? Yeah, I, it's funny. <laughs> like I never thought of myself as so um, tunnel vision with uh, hardcore, but at this point, yeah, it's all I, it's been my life for so long. Like if you don't know what the anthrax is, I can't talk to you like or something. I don't know. 
Um, so yeah, you know, he was, he was popular in high school. He's popular. You know, he had friends everywhere. So he good friends with Sean and Brian who ran the anthrax. Um, you know, they're like, he was like their annoying little brother, you know, but they loved him. And, uh, so, you know, in our high school, Ray's friends were in his band at the time, Violent Children, which is, would be Dave Rinelli, uh, Chris Getz, and um, Warren Kennedy was not in that high school. But, um, but you know, uh, Purcell obviously was going to the Anthrax. He lived in New York State, just over the line from where, uh, where I lived. He was my close friend, and you know, I I became friends with a lot of the people that he, that he knew, but I don't really remember a lot of specific names other than mm -hmm. people that nobody would know, like you know, Carla Gell, who was in COC for a while. You know, if you follow music at all, and you know, he knew everybody, and he introduced me to everybody, and they may or may not remember me. You know, right. so. You're in this space. You develop like this new new group of friends. It kind of gives you a new a new start, essentially, and it helps you find like a new version of yourself. As a guy that grew up, like yeah, you liked music. Music was a part of like I think it is part of most young people's lives. But you weren't like necessarily deeply passionate. You're not like I'm going to run a record label someday or I'm going to be part of that industry. You just liked music. But then that interesting space where like. Music can be music, but most music, if not all music, often has a culture associated with it. And you went from being like a fan of music to being immersed in like a music culture, like a subculture specifically. And you kind of found your people in there. Wouldn't go that far, but yeah, I, I, I loved it. And I remember the first couple of times I went, it, it, I felt like I was um, watching an episode of Gilligan's Island or something where they, where they like peek through the bushes and they see the, the, you know, quote unquote natives doing a dance, you know, cause like the, the circle pit dance is like, so, uh, primal. Um, I, it felt really alien to me in a lot of ways. Um, but, um, so, something about it was, was appealing, you know, and I, I think more of the performance and the music aspect of it than the, dance you know ritualized dancing and i definitely never and it's funny because i thought of ray as like anti-fashion but you know the whole anti-fashion thing was um kind of became its own fashion like the 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 dys uh dress code or something but you know i didn't that was a part of punk that never appealed to me um and actually in fifth grade i wrote a book report on punk you know, just because I liked music enough that I read, basically copied an article about punk where they were describing it as like harder than hard rock. Mm -hmm. And that was um, that was my early, early understanding of of bands like the Ramones and mm -hmm. those kind of that era. Right. So like it wasn't like you were like a duck to water off the bat. You weren't like, no, oh, this is like I had said earlier, my, these are my people. And you're like, ah, not quite. Yeah, right? yeah. So it's not like duck to water, but it was enough. And you at least were connected to the people enough that you were like, yeah, I'll like I'll partake. I'll be a part of this. Yeah. And I, I, I did love, you know, like music kind of got off of that. But music, even when I was like just reading the the lyrics on a Black Sabbath record, it was like. You know, music was sort of like your identity, like the bands you liked, you know, like uh, in, in I didn't do this, but in high school, you would see like Black Sabbath carved into a like the shape of a cross on a desk or Led Zeppelin, like the logo, like that's what kids like associated themselves with. I didn't just drop listening to, you know, Rush or whatever, but I, I it punk definitely eclipsed a lot of it listen as the <clears throat> canadian representative in this room if you'd stopped listening to rush i would have been really upset like really deeply offended i was happy way late in life to find out two fun facts about rush yyz is the initials of the toronto airport mm -hmm. and uh getty's name is actually gary but his mom you know has a polish accent or something so she can't pronounce gary yeah. so they call him you know his friends called him what his mom called him. <laughs> <laughs>
So you're still a fan of Rush today, I guess. Oh, I love, yeah. I mean, good man. they just seem like uh, funny, good, you know. Yeah. They're, uh, just watch the documentary. You got you, you can't not like them. And I, I, first of all, I love Rush being a Canadian. I think it's like, not every Canadian likes Rush, but I certainly like Rush. It's cool that you like him. Uh, I always am interested in Neil Peart because he's like, super like ultra genius crazy musician guy but has that thing that some ultra musicians have where there's just like the way they express their humanity is through music and then outside of that they're kind of like pretty difficult to deal with or pretty cold or pretty blank and you know pert was uh was an interesting cat for sure yeah i don't know a ton about him you know it's kind of He's, he's, he, he said enough about himself. I don't need to comment, but yeah, he's definitely interesting. And I, I, I remember this, uh, they, when they got inducted into the hall of fame, um, Alex Lifeson did the blah, blah, blah speech. Uh -huh. And it was so funny to like, uh, to, at least in my head, I feel like I was following along with what he was talking about, <laughs> even though the only word he said was blah, like, okay, I must be, I must. Either this is I'm imagining this, or he's he's actually telling a story here. <laughs> right, right. Um, everyone, this is the part of the podcast where we talk about Rush. Just so you know. Um, okay, let's go back to the story though. At what point does Revelation even? And I know that wasn't the name initially, but what did? At what point did the idea of doing a record label come up with with you and Ray? Um, I actually, yeah, it, probably not long before it happened yeah. ray had done his own label to put out the violent children record and he did a zine called cud maybe no that might be jeff roberts magazine so yoke i think was ray's uh fanzine but anyway ray did all this stuff he, is, he had a band. I tried out for uh, one of his bands when they lost a guitar player. And so anyway, I was always looking for something to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think part of it was like Ray helping me find something to do. And, you know, it served a need. And that's how th that came, came together. Okay. <clears throat> this is like where the story for me becomes real interesting because you didn't like your life goal wasn't to be a musician or to run a record label, right? I would have loved to be a musician, okay. you know, but it's just, I didn't have the, the discipline or the, you know, the IQ for memorizing. Um, it's, it's actually, I, I don't know how people remember hundreds, like how does Walter know all those words and all the good, like, how do people do that? I don't know. It's magic. Well, but also there's only one Walter, right? There's, right. And I'm sure like any time that like Walter. But you were in a band. You had to remember 20 songs. I don't know. You were in a bunch in, of bands. In, how do, in how do you theory, do I remember these. In a live setting, nobody knows if you remember in the words. You just hand them the microphone. Okay. <laughs> I've say, heard that. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say like, I don't like, if you put me to like a pressure test right now or like recite like three of your own songs, there's, there's not a good chance I'd be able to do that. Wow. Well, but, then I guess Ozzy, there's a live record where Ozzy gets the lyrics, you know, one of the verses he repeats, it gets it wrong on one of those live uh, Black Sabbath records. Well, like, so I uh, guess not everybody is Walter. Not everybody <laughs> is Walter. And I'd say like, what musicians can remember is I think like a relatively like questionable <clears throat> thing. Musicianship for me, or like good memories or any of that stuff is not totally unnecessary to be a musician. I think a musician is just... A good, a good musician is someone who is either got vision and knows how to make it happen or someone who can help someone else execute on their vision. Like Walter's kind of that whole package in terms of he's got incredible vision and he's a great player. He knows how to play um, very well. Um, but there are people like you need someone who, even if you're a great musician, you need someone who can execute on it, who can do it for you. And like, I'll give you an example. I'm a terrible guitar player, but I've played guitar in a ton of bands. I always surround myself with way better musicians because I know how to write a song. I just can't play everything that I can write. So musicianship, I think, is a, it's almost more like... Um, you got to get Ray on the show. <laughs> He's sort of the same. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, around, it's about surrounding yourself with the right people and figuring <clears throat> stuff out. And there are people like Walter who do have the whole package. 
But let's, so you didn't start a band or you didn't join a band or, or do it because it just, it seemed like you tried it and it didn't work or you didn't really pursue it too much. Um, ah, maybe both. Mm-hmm. So what did you want to do when you were in high school and you're like, Hey, this is what I want to do for a living growing up. Like, did you have any thoughts on it? Um, no, I, I mean, yes and no. I think I was st- like, you know, when you're a kid and you look at the world and everything is so arbitrary and stupid. Um, I just wanted to, you know, be a counterforce to that. Like, I'd like to destroy the world, you know, or like uh, just be a constant um, wrench in the machinery of this stupid system that f- developed that that our parents are, you know, playing along with. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't, you know, I was like, what can I do? You know, I'm going to go to jail. You know, I don't, I don't know what I'm, what I want to do. And also the, you know, the culture I came, you know, the suburban culture was kind of, uh, and maybe it's American culture is very anti, um, there, there's a strong in, 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 at least in the school that I went to, there's a strong anti-success, anti-intellectual and, you know, negative kind of, um, you know, destructive behavior kind of was a big thing. You know, that's why a lot of people were drinking and, you know, destructive drug use and things like that. Um, so I didn't really have, uh, an idea of what I wanted to do. I, I actually, when I had my first job was washing dishes at a restaurant and, and I asked my mom, can I just move in here? Um, cause they had, they had, um, people living in the restaurant that worked there just upstairs and you could live there for free. If you worked there, I was like, can I just move in here? And, uh, you guys moved to Connecticut. Um, and that obviously didn't go, thankfully didn't happen, but I, yes, I had no, my plan was just day to day. I didn't, I didn't have any vision about the future even when we started the label you know ray was talking about doing a compilation and i was like oh we're not just doing the war zone so we're doing another record too okay so all right so you do the record the first record war zone and uh, of course we want to mention uh ray um uh rabies uh thank you so much for everything you did and you know never forgotten so you do the wars on seven inch and oh. Canadian, uh, has emailed me recently about doing a documentary about rabies. Really? Yeah. That's cool. Very persistent, uh, guy. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he goes by, O. Mm-hmm. um, hopefully we will see he's, he's trying to get in touch with everybody. So that's awesome. I, I emailed Roger Moret to see if he wants to start there. Yeah. That's awesome. man. I hope that happens. Um, So you do the first record, was it a slow burn or was it an instant success? Instant. Yeah. Yeah. Like anything Ray Capo touched was pretty good. And then just hardcore was, you know, thanks to bands like Verbal Assault and Youth of Today kind of bridging from Revolution Summer to, you know, the mid eighties, hard, you know, hardcore had a lot of interest, at least on our level. So, uh, you know, you put a picture of Ray B's with a microphone in the ad, um, people ordered the record. Yeah. So that first record totally takes off and you guys start doing more records. Yeah. And Ray recruited everybody like, uh, on the war zone B side label, Richie Birkenhead drew the artwork for that. And, um, mutual friend, Jim Martin did the lettering for the original labels, which didn't get used. And then he did the lettering for the wars on cover. He actually did the cover for the youth of today, seven inch, um, which was originally going to be called crucial times. Mm-hmm. Have you seen that art? No, I haven't oh, seen it's it. great. He, you know, Jim Martin's a, gr- a great artist. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's got a, um, Freddie Alva has a, a book out of his, some of his art. And I, or I think maybe he put out his own book too but he did a lot of flyers for the anthrax, really intricate drawings. And he's got a really cool style. Um, so the label grows fast. 
yeah, we had serial seven inch releases just like, you know, Warzone, then the the Together comp, then uh, Sick of It All, then Gorilla Biscuits, and then, you know, we just kept putting out seven inches. And that was, like, Ray was kind of uh, a big, uh, was a big fan of Discord and um, Danger House, Touch and Go. So he loved seven inches and he loved the Devo seven inches. I don't know if you remember, they had a lot of really cool art and packaging on their records and um that was I, ray's vision was like a lot of really cool singles yeah at what point though does ray leave <clears throat> that was quite a bit a few years later a couple of years later um when he I th and this might tie into when his father died and I, he's he talks about it in interviews a lot but um i never really put it together so much but um I think that got him may have motivated the move towards spiritual life or whatever. And um, so I think that was around 89. Um, he's, you know, moved into the temple and got Krishna full time. And um, he wrote that last youth of today, seven inch, which is sort of has a lot of shelter kind of uh inspired lyrics and he wrote this shelter record maybe even before that um so that was around the time he was kind of drifting away from hardcore and um i remember one time um and I, in uh, we we went to new york um from new haven he lived in new york at the time um, we, we both went to the same school in, you know, we went to the same high school and then we went to the same college for a year mm -hmm. and then he dropped out, moved to New York to do Youth of Today full time and well, odd jobs and really focus on Youth of Today. So anyway, um, a friend and I went to New York to spend the day with Ray and we were just doing like kind of midtown touristy things and ray uh was just totally distant the whole day like you know and i think it might looking back it might have had something to do with his father dying relatively recently or hit it really affecting him at that point and i would guess that that was probably in 88 mm -hmm. um and i think he might have even been crying for some of the day and uh i think that was like he was having like a moment of realization like looking at my friends doing this like pointless shallow like uh l walking around new york laughing at stuff or just looking at stuff and and not really having any focus or direction and I think that may, you know, and, and just seeing just society, like, uh, you know, he, he had a moment like, and it wasn't like I really witnessed it cause he didn't talk about it, but I saw him kind of like withdraw. And at one, at one point we just like, we look around and Ray's gone, you know, he just was like left. So I think he was, you know, he went through something, you know, he had a, an awakening of some sort. And I'm not saying that I witnessed that moment, but I think there was a period in his life where he probably looked at a lot of things and was disillusioned with everything that was going on, whether it was in his band or his life or the world in general. And he just was like, you know, I need the shelter of, you know, his, you know, of God and everything that he uh, pursued. So um he moved into the temple and I, I would visit him once a week and um and yeah i don't remember the exact sequence of, of events but um at some point i had quit my job to do the label full-time and i was like well ray this is going to be my full-time job so this has got to be my thing like so we settled up on some you know the business and the the label became mine is this, that is that what you were asking me yeah so this okay. happened at the christian temple though um, it probably happened over the phone or while we were in New Haven for some reason. I don't remember exactly when and where. And he was totally like amiable to it. Like, yeah, that's a good thing. Let's 
Probably yeah. Was. Well, also I had been, you know, he'd been doing Youth of Today full time for the whole time. And I was doing the label pretty much on my own with just like, you're doing this, you know, here's, here's the next record or here's this record. And apparently I don't, I didn't remember this, but apparently there are some records that I arranged and some that he arranged, but I remembered it as he set everything up. Right. But, um, I've been told otherwise just by him and other people. Do you know what record that you guys parted ways on the, on the label? I think it was the, let's see, it would have been after chain of strength. So probably the bold seven inch Okay, was the last, you know, I, probably the last record that, uh, or the first record that Ray wasn't in charge of. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and again, for people who don't, who wouldn't know about revelation. And if you don't, I really encourage you to look it up. Even if you don't like, you know, like punk or hardcore, there's a lot of stuff on the label that's just super cool, spans a lot of different kinds of um, styles. And again, if you're someone who comes from like, maybe, you know, you like things that have, have an edge, but aren't like ultra aggressive, maybe check out a band like Texas, the reason if you're someone the little things are a little bit more punk, ch check out a band like the nerve agents. Like there's a lot of cool, um, uh, records on this label, but the, this time frame that you're talking about is where some of, but not all of like what would be considered like the early rev classics get released. And they're just like, boom, record after record, after a record, hugely impactful, create a whole culture across the country of people that are like, oh yeah, this is it. And that, of course, some of that had been started by of course, discord records, but a lot of people involved in discord had kind of like matured into like, as you said, like rev summer stuff and they'd gone on to found what would be their early ideas of what emo essentially started becoming. And then of course there's wishing well records who I know had some, um, a connection to Rev uh, for reasons we don't need to go into. Anyone who's a fan of the culture would know, but we can't uh, um, diminish their importance. But Rev really created, I guess, like maybe the next wave of hardcore and certainly created like a very specific kind of culture. So if I just frame it up and I don't want to put words in your mouth, without intending to, you suddenly found yourself at the center running a record label that had a ton of attention, a ton of focus, and was really part of like building culture. And you suddenly lost the one guy who'd kind of been like the visionary of, of the group. And you had to make a decision whether or not you kept doing it. Was that decision purely like, well, now this is my job. So is it like more like, well, I, I guess I'll do this. This is how I make money. Or was it like, no, I want to do this because I actually care about doing this. Um, I, I don't remember it being too conscious. Uh -huh. But it was like, you know, I've got all these plates in the air. This is what I, you know, like, I care about this plate a lot. This plate, you know, half as much, you know, like that's kind of, uh, it was my life. Yeah. So I didn't really look at it as a cohesive thing. I looked at it as well, you know, I got this record coming, the quicksand, you know, I don't remember it what specifically. It wasn't a conscious decision. No, like I said, I, I've never been one for planning or awareness or anything like that, you know? Yeah, you were just, you were, you were doing this, I don't want to say hardcore, but this record label had become your life. And so you just were like, okay, and things are simplified now. I'm just going to keep moving forward. Yeah, I, I mean, I just kept moving forward. I didn't really think about or look about, uh, think about the future particularly. Um, how old were you at this point? Um... I think I was 20 when I started it. So it might've been 22 or 23. Okay. So you're 23 years old. You're running a record <laughs> label that had made a huge impact in North America. And, and definitely at that point had done some like international stuff. Youth Today had gone to Europe. You had gone to Europe. So you could see the impact there. Were you nervous at all to take the helm on your own or were you yeah. just like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 probably wondered if it would even keep going, you know, like, cause <laughs> like to me, revelation was huge because Ray and youth of today were in this universe to me, Ray and youth of today were, you know, the leader, you know, like to me, um, I know there was other, you know, like it probably doesn't look that way to, you know, people that are in sick of it, all our friends with them. But to me, Ray was like the guy, you know, he was in charge of the label, this whole, you know, Ray made all this happen, you know, at least in my life. Um, and without him, I, I, I don't think, I think I probably thought 
is there's no way this is going to work. You know, like uh, this is over now. I just got to like, you know, make this record come out and, and that record come out. And, um, and I actually remember, I think I must have asked Walter and his brother Dylan and Purcell, like, yeah, what, what should I do, you know, or what should we do? You know, it was, uh, Rev was kind of also like just part of the community that the bands were all a part of. So it was, it was a little bit of, um, what are we going to do without Ray? And they were, everyone was worried about what, what he's, you know, well, what are we going to do without Ray? Cause you know, at the time there weren't a lot of people that we knew that were in the temple, you know, we, he, I think he's the first hardcore person that I know that like moved into the temple. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty serious. Yeah. You know, we were like, is this, is this a cult? Are they stealing Ray? Yeah. And, um, those were a lot of the thoughts that I remember. Um, the hardcore universe that, that revelation started in was, or was maybe not because Ray was doing shelter and other stuff, but it was changing too. It was like, there was sort of a revolution, not summer, but maybe a, a two year or three year revolution where, um, burn and, and quicksand and, um, inside out were, were kind of forming and, and doing, you know, they're branching the style out, um, from the very, you know, the sort of rigid hardcore definition that, uh, Ray and Purcell were, were doing with you to today. So, um, Actually, can, can we just hit on that for a second? Sure. That to me is like, I, I mean, obviously I'm so much of, of my life has been so impacted by, by revelation. And of course like discord and all, all these record labels, but I'd say rev was like, it was the record label that made me feel like a, I, as a kid could do something because it was like, Oh, these are just like kids. Like they're, they're roughly my age, like a little bit older than me. Like you're, you're older than me, but not by a ton. So it was like, a record label like Rev, but then also things that were somewhat local to me. I grew up in Calgary. Um, there was a record label called Excursion Records that was in Seattle that put out the Undertow record. And like, is that Ron? Uh, well, Ron helped because I'm going to bring up Ron in a second. But okay. Ron, um, Ron helped Dave, and Dave is my best friend. Dave okay, Larson. Dave. I yeah. Dave Larson. Okay, yeah. that's uh, my memory is terrible. So I, I I think I know Dave. Yeah. Well, um, you you definitely know Dave. I probably know Dave better than I knew Ron. Um, and I, I haven't talked to Dave since the eighties probably, but anyway, I'll let you continue. Um, so Rev made me feel like kids, kids could do it. Uh, kids my age could do it and could do things. And it's not like growing up in Calgary, um, there, there was a tradition of really cool Calgary kind of like thrash crossover bands and punk bands, but there wasn't like hardcore, hardcore, hardcore bands. And I think the bands that my friends and I started were the first of that. We were awful, like terrible, but, um, we were really influenced by what was happening on revelation and we were inspired also by what was happening with like in Seattle with like undertow and then later on with bands like strain. Suddenly I felt like I had this group of mentors that I didn't know, but were like being like, Oh yeah, of course you can do that. And, and here's how we did it. And it seemed more accessible than something like discord, which of course was still doing records, but they were off at that point. Like Fugazi was a thing and it was just, uh, it seemed, it seemed almost like too intellectual to me and too, like it was inescapably mature for me at that point. Cause I was a little kid. I hear you. And, um, when we made they, a dumb joke about that in the first crisis, <laughs> crisis records ad, um, just like uh, one of the lines was <laughs> new discord stuff too weird for you. <laughs> and, and we used the, uh, ACDC Powerage font for the word weird. Um, uh, I just thought, the, uh, any chance I, I have to use that font, I, I grab it. Well, um, uh, but just to, to um, put things into perspective for people that don't know much about hardcore, Revelation was not unique at all. There was, other than the fact that it was sort of in the unbelievably lucky, fertile ground of Youth of Today, Warzone, and Gorilla Biscuits, there was, you know, smorgasbord records and um, tons of labels that were out at the same time and before us and everybody, you know, you could, you could have a label, you could have a magazine, everybody that was kind of doing your own band, doing your own label, doing your own 
magazine or radio show, all that stuff was part of punk culture. Do it yourself. This, that's, you know, Discord was uh, an early example of that, but every label was, was like that. And there were, you know, icons like SST, uh, Alternative Tentacles and hundreds of others. And then there were our friends that all had their own labels like Schism, Smorgasbord, and um, I'm sure somebody in Verbal Assault had a label and every town had, you had to have a label to put out your, your band or your friend's band. So yeah, yeah. Revelation was sort of a little bit more of a, a second generation of that because Ray had been in um, Violent Children and, and Reflex from Pain and maybe other bands and, and he'd been through the process a few times. So he knew what, you know, he knew what to do and he had an agenda and yeah. it worked out. Well, it's just such a cool, <clears throat> it's cool for me to be having this conversation with you and digging into a, into this part specifically, because like the, this next kind of phase of Reb where it's like, he's no longer involved. Um, I think some of the coolest records that ever came out in Rev started here, right? Like some of the things that were like really pushing and changing. And it's like, I, I liked how you phrase it. it. It wasn't exactly a revolution summer type moment, but it was a revolution. It was like a, different things were entering. So Ray now has departed. You're leading the, the ship. At this point, are you the, are you, you were, I would assume, employee one of Rev. You were the first person who was solely drawing their um, living off of Rev. Is that correct? Yeah. So who was employee two? Um, maybe Craig Calaruso. I, I don't remember, but people came and helped. Well, people volunteered. Like I, um, do you know Mark Hanau? Mm -hmm. um, he was in a band called Betray. Mm -hmm. Uh oh, uh oh, <laughs> present tense or what is it? Is that infinitive? I don't know. Um, and uh, he he helped out a lot when when he would visit, and then just friends would come over and fold envelopes and uh, you know fold covers, all that stuff, um, stuff records. Um, employees, I can't remember if so. Just trying to think back to who was actually a paid employee. Um, John Munera, who was in Seizure. Um, F. Scott, who was in Slipknot. Craig Colarusso, who was in a lot of bands, who ran a label called Mud Industries and was a great artist. Um, and uh, Rich Salvagno, who was in Contraband and Onion. Mm -hmm. Those were the first people that worked there that I remember. Okay, so Ray has split. Now it's the next it's the <clears throat> next chapter. Let's just say for loosely for our conversation. Were there already people working at Rev, or when you made the decision of like I'm just going to carry on? Was it still just like you you doing it all? Yeah, it was just me. Okay, I how think. did those next releases come up? Were they already like, hey, we're going to do this, or were the bands coming and bring you records, or were you saying going to people I want to do your record? Uh, it's, I, I think a lot of the stuff was already kind of on the calendar, like judge was happening and, you know, they, they put out their first record self-released on schism and, um, and then I don't remember how or why, but we got to do their album. And so there was a lot of things that kind of just fell into our lap because Walter's doing a new band and, you know, do you want to put it out? Yes, of course. Um, Inside Out was um, Mark Hayworth played bass in, you know, Mark Hayworth and Rob Hayworth were friends with Walter and, and everyone from when the New York bands would go out to California. Mm -hmm. So that's how they heard about Inside Out. And I think Mark actually made a tape of Hard Stance, Inside Out. No, Inside Out came out a different time. Anyway, Mark Hayworth was sending tapes to Walter mm -hmm. Um, like check out these bands. And so that's probably how we heard about Inside Out. And uh, anyway, I, I, a useful answer to this question would be a lot of it sort of was the same people that were in the bands earlier formed new bands. Mm -hmm. um, and then and Purcell and Walter and Dylan were also involved and, and other people were helping um, suggest things that we should do. So at what point do you start hiring people on like actually like building out a company and 
again, for everyone listening who's not punk, part of punk and hardcore, the idea like your friends would come over on a Saturday and spend their whole Saturday folding record covers might seem totally alien to someone else. But to us, it's like, well, of course they would do that. They're your friends. And I used to run a label when I was younger. And my friend, Bob, who, uh, Bob, I love you. Thank you so much for all you did. One day he said to me, you know, Aram, there's nobody else that I know that I would go and spend my entire Saturday on a beautiful Saturday day all day in a basement or in a, like a windowless room folding record covers and watching Curb Your Enthusiasm and, and eating okay pizza. But I leave here after eight hours of this unpaid labor <laughs> and I feel great and I had such a great time. He was like, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's a commentary on my character or if it's commentary on what you're doing, but I, I love it. I love doing this. And when I ran, was running a label, that idea that people would just show up and help was so a part of it until it got to a point where it's like, you know, I actually need people here and you have to start hiring people. And I remember when I first started doing that, I was like, I don't want to do that. It's going to change everything. And I'm scared. And, and it, it actually ended up being, being fine, but, um, it was a huge, scary commitment. So for you, when you started hiring people, again, you'd said like, I don't really, I didn't really think things through. It just kind of happened. But do you know when you started hiring people? Yeah. I'm, as soon as we had too much for me to do by myself. Yeah. Well, but your friends were helping you. You're, you're saying. Well, that was more just like helping assemble records. Nobody was happy to, I mean, I don't remember people volunteering to like open, you know, answer mail, pack orders and ship boxes. You know, that that's something I would usually have to pay people to do or, you know, employees or I would do it myself. Around what release was this that you, that you started hiring someone? Um, Just in general. I don't remember, but definitely by 89, 88, 89. Yeah. Um, and when I went on tour with Youth of Today, um, I just sort of handed the label to a friend of mine and he just ran it while I was gone. Like just ship all the orders and hopefully he did it right. You know, I've heard, you know, I'm slow and meticulous. So I, I, I like to think I don't miss shit. Like if somebody orders one thing, I don't ship them the other thing, but I've heard plenty of stories. Like I ordered this record, but they, they sent me a different one. So maybe that was Brian. I don't know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or it could have been uh, and then there's sometimes if we're out of something right, we're out of this hope you like this yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, so at some point you start hiring people and one of the things you said to me uh, a couple times when we've been warming up for this was like yeah I don't really consider myself a leader but I mean you're running a record label and that record label is serving a community of friends like you're and like I like how you said earlier every town kind of had to have its record label Rev just happened to be in very fertile soil with just the right people at the right time. Um, but suddenly you've got a responsibility to these people and suddenly you have employees. So by definition, like you're either a manager, like I'm just kind of managing this stuff or you're a leader and you're like, okay, I'm going to choose to take the wheel here and I'm going to lead us in a direction. I don't want to say that you're one or the other, and that there was that thought process, but at that point, you clearly had some kind of responsibility to, to, to take on the next steps. And you were very young. So how did you learn how to do it, to lead people like that? I mean, people, people know how to, you know, like just you learn how to do stuff. So it wasn't, the work led us, you right. know, like somebody sent us a letter. They told us they want this. They put in this amount of money. Yeah. We have to, that's, that's our job today. You know, like that, and, or a, a store called us and they said, we want, you know, 50 whatever's, you know, and that was the work was, was our manager really, I think. And, you know, I was just like, can you help me do this that I'm doing? Like, watch what I do and then do it, you know? And that's what, that's kind of all we did was answer mail and, and, um, you know, pack orders. I, I remember we were all just in one room. Um, and John Munero would, <laughs> would, you know, um, he would, he would come up with a funny name for every store. Like this sounds like this. And he would, you know, anytime he would say something, we'd write it on the wall, like, uh, you know, the nickname for the store. And, and now, um, he doesn't, he works from home. The, Tom works from home now, but when he worked in the office, he would he would come up with these insane uh, puns that were I would always just write them down when when 
he would say them, but that, that was the kind of uh, atmosphere, just like we're, we're all just getting, getting boxes out the door. Yeah. Um, sorry, that, that, that didn't really make a whole lot of sense. Dude, but you, um, you, you said the coolest thing, which was the, let, the work led us. And I think that that's, that's perfect. Um, can I bring in a Ron Gardapi story here? Yeah. Um, so uh, again, you know, our always, oh, oh, thank you, Ron, for everything you did. Uh, always remembered. Um, Ron passed in the past few years and it's a huge loss for a ton of people. So thanks, Ron. Um, so Ron told, I hear this story like secondhand from Dave Larson. He's like, man, Ron told me this story. He went, he did this East Coast trip out to like, you know, it was like kind of like the East Coast, like, fantasy world trip where you like go out and you go to the anthrax, you go check out all these things. And he went and stayed with, with Jordan. And J he was like, Hey Jordan, like, you know, do you have any rev rarities around? And you're like, yeah, they're up in my attic. And Ron was like, dude, it's like unbelievably hot outside. It's gotta be so crazy hot in your attic. And you're like, yeah, maybe <laughs> Ron went up in the attic and he was like, it was like being in this wonderland of rev stuff, like the rarest, craziest stuff. It's just up in this guy's attic, but it was like being in a sweltering oven. And, it, and Dave was like, I guess Ron came down and was like, Hey, Jordan, like, do you think you should have those records up there? It's too hot. And that you were like, Oh really? Yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> It wasn't that big a deal to you. And Rob was like, oh my God. Yeah. And this is before Rev records are worth what they're worth today. Like all that early stuff. Um, I don't know if that's a true story, but I always, it is true. I remember that was, that was um, off of, uh, I think it was off of Dixwell Avenue in Hamden, Connecticut. We rented a room from an engineering company that my friend's mom worked at. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, we don't use this room a hundred bucks a month. And, um, and then like, I found the basement and I was like, can we use the basement? Yeah, no problem. Can we use the attic? Yeah, no problem. So I just, you know, put, I moved, I, I, I did try to live there for a little while, but they didn't like that, but I, I used their basement. We used the attic as storage. And, um, I think we kept the records for the most part in the basement. Um, but, and the print in the attic. But there was a time when we had too many shelter records. Um, and so some of those went in the attic, mm -hmm. the brown vinyl. And uh, but it was actually I, I, I think it was not record warp hot. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it takes quite a bit of heat to make a record warp. And I, I learned this from a guy that worked at a record store in um, Georgia or, or, or North Carolina. Anyway, one of the southern states. Um, <clears throat> We were buying, you know, I went on a road trip when I got my first car, a legal car, um, and we were buying rare records at the store and the, and the guy that worked there, like, just took him, you know, August sun and wherever we were, throws him in the trunk. And I was like, aren't these going to warp? And he's like, oh, no, uh, in the trunk, they're fine. If they're in where there's glass, they're going to warp. And that's been lifelong rule of thumb for mine, uh, oh. for me. And I never, unfortunately, now I have uh, a Rav Four, which doesn't have a trunk, so I can't really leave records in my car um, anymore because there's glass everywhere. There's, there's no, yeah, there's yeah. No trunk. All right, so um, I, I just love that story though, because like I always thought of that story of from being a record collector and like what, like from a teenage years record collector. I always think of that like record collector mentality of like, good God, like what's going to happen to these records? And Ron's like, oh yeah, George just seemed like not worried about it at all. Um, and this being the first time we've ever met, I always had this idea that you were just like a pretty like easygoing guy about stuff. Like, yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah, I am. Okay. <laughs> so what, when did you move to California and why? Um, oh, that's a, a, an often told um, story for people that uh, know me, but um, so when I was very little, I, I, um, I was like, um, I, I talked to my cousins who lived in California and I was like, what's California like? And, you know, I don't remember what they said, but the weather was good. So like, I want to live somewhere where it's summer all year round. Mm. Um, and they're like, oh, just move to California. It's great. All right, but where in California? It's a big, big state. Where what's a good place? And they're like anywhere. Just go anywhere. I don't know. 
I was like, well, name a place. And my cousin said, Huntington Beach. That's fine. You know, it's a good place. And it just stuck in my head. I was probably like, you know, 10, 11, um, maybe eight. I don't know. I was a little kid. And many, many years later, Purcell um, was going to visit some friends in Huntington Beach. And he said, do you want to go with me? He asked, you know, um, me and Jay Anarchy and a few other people um, if we wanted to go on like a two week vacation with him. And I said, you sure? Yeah, I've never, you know, never been there. Um, and so I went out here and uh, I had a good time. I met uh, Greg and Jim Brown and they became lifelong friends. And um, and then a few months later, uh, you know, I, was, um, I, I don't remember if my lease was up, but, uh, you know, there's there was thought of moving like I don't need you know I, I had no particular re Ray was in the temple I had no particular reason to be in New Haven you know I wasn't in college anymore I didn't have a job anymore so I was free you know and so I talked to Siv and Walter they were moving into a place in Queens and I looked at an apartment there um and I don't remember I was it just didn't seem logistically like you know I was comfortable with you know, Connecticut's parking and, you know, the pricing and everything just was, would have been easier in Connecticut. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll just stay in Connecticut. And then I just started thinking, you know what, I'm going to move to, you know, I had a good time there and, uh, and I just decided to move out here. So I called the people we stayed with. Can I stay with you for another couple of weeks? I flew out, found a, a house to rent and, um, arranged it all. And then a few months later, just rented a truck, put everything in there, um, and drove out with some friends. So you move out, um, Rev keeps going from here. At what point do you stop, like essentially like picking the bands or having people bring the bands to you? At what point does someone else start kind of becoming responsible for what bands are gonna be on the label? Oh uh, yeah, that would have been probably mid nineties. Um, but. Already in the early nineties, there was already people there who, you know, like everybody that worked at Rev was into music as much or more than me, mm -hmm. you know, Dennis Remzing was, you know, Popeye, um, for, who's a singer for Farside and other bands, um, Chris Lohman, um, Steve Reddy and you know, Mike Madrid and Greg Brown, everybody was either working there or hanging out there. So, you know, the community sort of, uh, you know, the scene, you know, provides information and, and, and guidance. Um, so that, that kind of was part of it. And, um, and then at some point I was um, maybe less willing to, um, make the decisions or, you know, um, and John, not sure who ran a label in Connecticut, moved to, to California and worked there. And he helped a lot with um, guiding the label and um, a mutual friend of ours, Beth, who wrote All Ages. Um, she worked there also and, and they helped. And, um, and then in the mid to late 90s is when we, we actually hired somebody just like, you know, your job is to, you know, talk to bands. At what point did you start the distribution part of Rev? Um, well, we, we did a bit of it in the eighties, but it really started when, um, Mike Hartsfield and Dennis Ramsing, you know, kind of moved into the area of Huntington beach and, um, they had their labels and they, you know, one or both of them worked at Rev occasionally, Dennis full time and, and Mike occasionally, and they were running their labels and we just started just distributing their, their stuff. And then, um, and then, and then we started just buying SST and other labels and, um, tried to become more of like a one stop for relevant music for us. Right. So it wasn't like an intentional, like, oh, hey, we need another revenue stream here. We're going to make this happen. It just kind of naturally happened. Yeah. Somebody, I think somebody was like, why don't we do this? And I was like, yes, perfect.
you know, it's interesting. Cause like the more I'm hearing about it, like, you know, it's again, when you look at something from a distance, you're like, Oh, they probably did this because of this, because of this. Yeah, it was like, strategic. No, it wasn't strategic. <laughs> totally. And like, especially as I've gotten older and I, now I run a business, like I, I, I kind of, I, I break things down more from like, oh, they must've been trying to create multiple revenue streams so that they could focus, like they'd always have money to do the record label and not have to make bad choices. Well, but, obviously those conversations happen like as like, um, the reasoning, right. but, um, it wasn't like revenue stream it wasn't a thought process and aha distribution it was like we should do distribute you know we're selling we're shipping these boxes let's put more stuff in those boxes yeah. that kind of thing dude it's so funny because like when i break this stuff down it's like okay well, anything that i've ever done with any band it's not been this like hmm, what's the next strategic move it's like oh okay well we did that now this makes sense but when i'm in in like a business sense and especially how i run my business now i'm always trying to think ahead because i have like a whole team that i have to make sure that I can help grow and do this, do all this stuff. And then also like, I want to grow our business in a thoughtful way so we can do stuff effectively. So I, it's funny that as a punk, I usually just do things from like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. Let's do that. But now as a business leader, I, I am a bit more like, okay, hey, here's what the problem is. What's the solution. But if I put back in kind of like more punk thinking, it's more like, you're like, Oh, here's the solution. Oh, and it actually kind of addresses this, this thing that we hadn't really thought of, but cool. Is that, that's kind of seems like the story of how Rev grew in a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, again, water runs downhill. So, um, that's most of what happens at Rev is either an an individual deciding this is what I want to do. So this is what we should do, Mm -hmm. or this just made sense and it fit, you know, it somehow fit in like Dennis worked at Rev full time. He had a label, probably didn't have time to focus on his label. So why not just distribute through Rev and going back to what you were saying earlier about like, Rev, like uh, you, you actually didn't say this, but I feel like Verbal Assault, Youth of Today, Uniform Choice, a handful of bands um, carry the torch from the Revolution Summer kind of like progression era hardcore into like the mid 80s or to the late 80s. And then when Rev was doing Quicksand and into another and stuff, then there was like um, new age and conversion kind of carrying the torch and, and, and then, and bridge nine, and, you know, every label kind of like is part of the evolution of, of this, the scene. And, and I kind of feel like certain, some labels are, are closer to the, you know, the strict definition and, and some labels are, uh, you know, further away from what, what Ray's, you know, and Ray's concept of hardcore is, what I adopted. So right, like, right. um, I, I apologize to people that, that don't see, see it the same, but, um, anyway, I feel like conversion and new age were very, um, in the same spirit, um, and, and almost taste as, as what, um, youth today was, was doing. So, yeah, um, I, I they, know. I really, even though I wasn't listening to that type of music at that point in my life, I appreciated what they were, what they were going through and doing with their bands and their labels. Yeah. It's interesting for me when you're saying that, cause like <clears throat> conversion was like Rev was like a generation of kids that were like older than me were um, like the, the core bands where Re- um, new age and conversion were more kids around my age. Yeah. And so like, that was kind of like, or maybe even just slightly older, you know, but like new age, uh, I talk a lot with my friends about like how important new age was and of course conversion as well. So a huge shout out to Mike and, and Dennis. Uh, thanks for, for everything. Another thing you'd mentioned to me uh, in email that I made me laugh and it, I want to bring it back later on uh, to something I'd read in Beth's book. Um, but you mentioned like, you know, I kind of view myself almost more like an accountant than, than like really being like quote unquote a, a leader at this point. So if I think of someone like John who played this role, uh, who else has played like a, a role in kind of forming what Rev continues to become? Yeah, um, a lot of people in the 90s and, and the early 2000s, like we had a lot of people for a while. Um, and I think this is something that I talked about with you on the phone maybe, but there was a time when we had something like 18 or 20 people and it was um, a little out of my ability it was beyond my ability to to really communicate and keep uh keep be a good boss or manager of that many people so 
when things have been, you know, things are, are smaller now and, and I find it more manageable and I think people are happier than now than they were then. Not that everybody is super happy, but you know, it's, it's a job for a lot of people. Um, but, um, yeah, I tend to, uh, take care. You know, I, I have a hard time delegating. I'm not a good time manager. So I, I end up, um, needing help from people that have skills that I don't. And I've been lucky to find people like, uh, over the years, like John and, um, Beth and, uh, you know, that Steve Reddy, Dennis Ramsing in the early days. Um, and then later on, we, we've had people that have really, uh, been, uh, helpful for years or decades. So I know, I know, uh, Vic, really played like did a lot of almost like label management like would you almost say like Vic was like the label manager I mean I, I don't know I we don't have we don't have titles but um she handled a lot of um accounting and you know relationships you know she maintained relationships with um people that she liked and you know she knows a lot more people than I do so you know she and she's way faster than me. Um, I, I went one time I did a, a test where um, I asked her to do something, uh, an accounting thing, and I did it. And I was like, hey, could you do this and just t time how long it takes you? It took me an hour and 40 minutes. It took her 20 minutes. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah, and now there's, there's uh, so um, our uh, another. Um, person that works at Rev is uh, Valerie and she is, you know, as fast as, as Vic and or maybe faster. Um, and that's been incredibly helpful. Totally. So you got these characters that have done this stuff and I guess shout out. Oh, so, to and did we mention Adam Lance? Well, yeah, well, I, we did. I'm going to go back to him right now. Okay. So like shout out to Vic. Um, I, I know that Vic's not with the label anymore, but it, huge impact on our culture and our scene. So thank you for everything you've done and continue to do. Adam Lentz, uh, a guy that I've known forever and has definitely played like a pretty major role in Rev now for 20 years. He's been with the label for 20 years. Yep. He just, uh, he just celebrated or lamented his 20th anniversary <laughs> with us. Um, yeah, we're still, we gave him a, um, a Chrome stapler engraved with, uh, yeah, to 10 years of serving uh, something like for 10 years in service of hardcore or something like that. Um, and I'm, I was trying to find a gold plated one for his 20th anniversary, but I could not find it. It doesn't exist. Apparently really there's not a market for gold plated staplers. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't believe it. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, we got to, I got to figure out something to do. I, I made, I made, um, homemade stromboli for him and Greg Brown. They, they both had uh 20 year anniversaries around the same time. And Tom, our graphic designer, has been there for 20 years also. Wow, that's wild. Um, so you've got these people, and of course, we got to mention Sam as well, who um, you know helped set up this interview and played in a, in a ton of really important bands. Um, so if you think of like Adam or Sam, what role do they play in, in the organization now, or in the company now, or Rev, whatever? Yeah, I mean, it, we still don't really have titles, which Sammy is annoyed with, mm -hmm. but... Um, you know, Adam kind of does a bit of everything and he started out doing, I think maybe sales and, but he, you know, he is like, uh, one of those people that loves hardcore and, and listens to new hardcore mm -hmm. and he's, he's signed bands and, um, he talks to all the labels and, you know, he's one of those people that can get along with people that, uh, most people can't get along with, you know, he's put out a lot of bands that he really likes and carries a lot of music that he likes well and now at his request let's say some nice things about sam what is, what is sam what oh is yeah sam, sam and so sam started a two a little oh, maybe two years ago where he he was calling um and just had advice like why don't you do this or why don't why doesn't rev do this and eventually uh, i i thought it would be good to to hire him um I think he was like his company was moving or he, he was losing a job or quitting. I don't know. Somehow he had the opportunity to work at Rev. Um, so um, that's that's what uh, happened. And um, he's he's really good at um, 
kind of like fishing the filtering the muddy ideas into like s refining them into some clarity for me because I'm I'm sort of terrible at, at organizing time or and thoughts and everything and uh, I I've noticed like we we could have a meeting where everybody's talking and uh, and we're, we're all saying different things and we all have all these ideas and then Sammy just will say something like uh, oh well why don't we do this this and this and it's like everybody is like uh, everybody's suggestion is somehow fit into this very simple you know, thing that Sam came up with and he's just really good at, um, organizing, uh, a bunch of cats with ideas into like a cohesive plan. And that's something I've never been really good at. Uh, you know, I'm not a great listener. I'm not a great, uh, organizer, as I said, and, and he's, he's really good at, at, at that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, so yeah, that's, that's been, that's been helpful because, I, I might have mentioned to you, like I, I spend so much of my time on administrative tasks. It's it's hard for me to look up and see where we're going, you know, as far as like looking six months down the road, what we, what we should be trying to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that leads me to something I'm real curious about, um, and I want to ask it in two ways. So the first is like again, when that book uh, All Ages Reflections on Straight Edge came out, like I like any other hardcore kid at the time was like, holy crap, there's a book about our scene. And at that time, there really wasn't that. And I was reading all these interviews and just like drinking up every single word like it was gospel. But I remember you reading yours and being so blown away. I think one of the questions was like, are you happy? Like, are you happy with, with Rev and what you've done? And I think your answer, I'm gonna to totally massacre it here, was like, I don't know, there's a lot of a lot of better things people could have done with their time than do a punk record label. And I was like, oh my God. So. I read that, and I'm sorry if I'm misquoting you, but I think it was something like that. Um, are you happy with with your career path and, and what you've done? Uh, yeah, I mean, what's funny is I, I've gone through periods where I felt like I was doing harm to the environment. Like, we're just selling plastic records. Like, nobody needs records anymore, you know, and um, being down about it. But um, And then I went through a period where I felt like, uh, well, at least if, if all we're doing is getting, you know, the, some vegetarian songs out and making some people consider being vegetarian, like that's enough, you know, that's, that's impacting the world in a positive way. But, um, you know, now, now starting to think about it is like, you know, Ray, Ray's, you know, the ideas that are in the lyrics, you know, in my case, particularly Ray's ideas, I think are, are really positive for, for a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, that, that need to hear it. And also, the, you know, the, the art and the music that came out of, um, a lot of, uh, you know, the stuff that we put out is, is valuable and, and, you know, we don't have to be, you know, making cures for cancer to be helping, you know, people. So, um, that's, that, that's how I, uh, rationalize or tell my, you know, feel good about what, I, what I do. Yeah. Uh, there's <clears throat> in terms of like social impact youth of today and, and like the vegetarianism that was attached to attached to them and that like spread out. Um, and the role that Rev has had from like a social impact point of view is like, there are people who are vegetarian and they don't even realize they're vegetarian or vegan because of Ray Capo. It's like maybe their friend got into it from Youth of Today or from like a Rev band and then they got someone else into it and that person got someone else into it. And then there's this person who's like maybe their favorite band's The Who, but they're vegetarian and they don't realize that train of thought, um, that ripple effect. And I'd say like, you know, like obviously I'm a big fan of the label, but also just from like pragmatically being a person who's involved in um, social services and being involved in um, what I hope is a company now that's useful to the world. All it takes is someone to be able to talk about something courageously and cohesively in like a good voice, a strong voice and be consistent to like change one mind. That one mind can change 10 minds to a hundred minds. I think it, I think what Rev has done, at least for, for me from a like cultural forming standpoint and kind of like sh pushing thinking has been pretty significant. And I, I love to hear that you're, you know, you're feeling the same about it. But that does lead me to my next question. You did return to school later in life. So what was behind that? 
Oh, wow. Yeah, I, <laughs> that's funny. I forgot about it. It's been so long. Um, but uh, I, f I, I remember I was sitting at my desk one day and um, and I was doing some accounting thing or, you know, some little bit of math. And I noticed that I was struggling with it. And I was like, this, you know, like, I feel that, you know, this problem does not deserve this pain. You know, like, there's something going on here. Like, I'm losing some brain cells or something. Like, I'm, I'm what do you call it? I'm atrophying. Right. Um, so I, um, a few years earlier, I had, um, <clears throat> we had a college graduate working at, at Rev as a data entry guy. His name happens to be Greg Brown also, the, the Greg Brown that kind of inspired me to move to California. Mm -hmm. um, and I was saying to him, like, well, if you're going to do data entry, you know, we need an accountant. Why don't you just take a couple of accounting courses and, you know, then you can be our accountant. You don't have to just, like, do data entry. You can do, like, the job of that we're hiring other people to do and you'll get paid more or whatever. You'll have a real, you know, career money instead of, um, and you can transfer that knowledge, like entering um, five Gorilla Biscuits records, 10 Judge Red, whatever, into a, into a computer, that's giving you no real benefit. So um, I talked him into going to the, there's a community college across, sort of across, across from Rev, and we, uh, you know, I talked him into going, but only on the condition that I would take the course too. So uh, we we signed up for the accounting class. We bought one book, and uh, we were going to share it. And ultimately, he was like, "I'm not doing this," and he stopped going. And I just kept going, mm -hmm. and um, and I actually found it really useful, almost more useful than my full degree that I got later. Um, but that one or two accounting courses I took really helped me with understanding what, what was going on with Revelation and why I, that's sort of why I do the bookkeeping now, because it's actually one of those things where I, I understand what's happening. Like, I can't explain to you how one needle dropped onto a record can make two different sounds come out uh, of two different speakers. You know, one needle, two, how's that working? Um, I've had it explained to me, but I don't. You know, I still don't really understand, but I, I can, I understand the, the bookkeeping now, thanks to this, this course I took at, at uh, Golden West College. Anyway, so a couple years later, I was doing something and um, I was struggling with something and I felt like my brain was, was getting uh, mushy and I thought oh, I should just take some classes and, you know, sharpen up. So I took calculus and some stuff that I'd already taken, but just to like get back um, on track, I took, a, you know, C++, some, some programming classes. And, um, and after a couple of um, semesters, I thought, oh, I wonder if I can like cobble together the, the college that I took in Connecticut and the classes I took here into a degree. And so I asked and they, and they said, yeah, well, you, you know, you, all you need is one more class and you can transfer into the university or, you know, local university. So I took, finished that class. I signed up for the university. And then sadly, it took another three years of full time at that school to get my degree. I, I didn't have to retake classes, but somehow the, the three years I had in Connecticut, the one year I, or two years I had it, three years at community college, three years in Connecticut, and then I still had to do three full-time years at UC Irvine to get my bachelor's degree, but I did. But like why? Weeks before my uh, 40th birthday. Um, oh, so the reason I went to school is because I, I thought my brain's getting mush. Yeah, yeah. And then I don't know why, I just thought like it would be good to know. Yeah. So, you know, computer science degree, it would be helpful. Yeah. And it was, I like, I've... I've written software now for Rev that helps, you know, there was a job that Vic used to spend um, something like 12 or 14 hours a month on, and now it's done in like four seconds. I'm gonna ask you some tough questions. Um, How tough? Pretty tough, you can tell me if you don't wanna do them though. Okay. Um, so 
earlier in our conversation, you're kind of talking about the stupid system that we're all stuck in, right? And like our parents help voice it up. And, you know, as we become adults, we get, there's parts of it that we play into and we kind of have to, there's parts of it that we can avoid. Um, you, you seem to me to really care about doing things differently or having some kind of social impact. On the flip side, when you are running a punk record label and you don't have employees, you don't have to do anything, uh, like you're not responsible to anyone, you can make all sorts of decisions, but then compromise can set in when a business has employees and you do have to like make money to keep the lights on and everything. Um, what's been the push and pull for you around um, compromise, compromising your ideals and doing what you want to do versus what you feel you need to do to keep the lights on? That might be more complicated of a question than I can even come up with an answer for, but I would say we, you know, there are things we have done. Uh, I see what you're saying. Like, uh, this could be a tough in the sense that you, you might have to admit that you did something that you didn't love just cause it would make money or something like, well, I'm not asking you to, I'm not asking <clears throat> you to do that, but like things become more complex when you have to people pay people's paychecks. Right. And like, one of the way I'll frame up the question is Chris from Bridge Nine Records does a t-shirt company called Sell These Tees. And when I was putting out records when I was younger, I asked Chris, um, hey, how come you don't do Bridge Nine as you're living, like to how you make money? Because that seems like the dream job to me. And he was like, oh, no. And he's like, if I, if I drew all of my money from Bridge Nine, then I would have to start making some decisions on what would sell versus what I want to do. That's awesome. And he's like, I don't want to be in that position. I just want to put out records that I like putting out for my friends. And if it blow and if they blow up and they're great, awesome. If they don't, no big deal. But I'll always draw my money from Sully's. And he stayed true to that. And whether or not someone likes or dislikes Bridge Nine or like likes likes or dislikes that answer, that guy has made a distinct choice to not try and eke out a living on that because of that ethical concern. I thought it was a real interesting answer. Yeah. I I I don't have a, a conscious answer like that, but I, I can I can explain that we've got Gorilla Biscuits. Mm -hmm. That's that it, it may not be Sully's, but it it really frees us up to not. And I don't and I don't just mean Gorilla Biscuits. Mm -hmm. Like Gorilla Biscuits, Youth of Today, Judge, Texas is the reason. You know, we have a handful of of bands that I look at as like there are these fires that you really just need to keep them going. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not going to go out on their own. They're, it, it doesn't take a genius to, to run a label when you have uh, Gorilla Biscuits start today and use it today, break down the walls and, and other great records like that, that people love. So that has given us this freedom to not do, you know, like I've thought, at, at Rev 150, I was like, maybe 150 should be where we stop putting out new stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's just keep pressing the old stuff. Yeah. And thankfully, we, you know, I didn't, <laughs> thankfully, people didn't listen to me. Right. And they were like, well, how about one more? I got this band. And, you know, so Adam basically kept the label going from, from then. Mm -hmm. Um And uh, so I, I, I think that answers your question. Totally like answers. we we've, we, we definitely have done things where it's just like, I don't love putting out five different colors of, I, I personally don't like putting out multiple colors of records, but the bands want it. We do it. It makes extra money. You know, I can't complain, but. And that's a perp that everything you just said there is perfect. And like, so I love that. So like the, the bands you mentioned, these are like forever bands. They're, they're bands that I think, I think every generation will be like, oh, I have to get that Gorilla Biscuits record is beyond a classic. I actually think the importance of that Gorilla Biscuits record it hasn't even really been, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I think like that, that record to me becomes more relevant culturally and also musically over time where you see like what a rare moment that was to be able to capture that lightning in a bottle. But you have all of these like forever records essentially that I think forever will carry on a generation. So that gives you kind of like a, an ability to be like, okay, because we have that financial base, it allows us to have a little bit more freedom to do other things. And although we don't particularly, here's a, here's a compromise. I don't love um, pressing out tons of different colors of vinyl, but I know the bands want it. And I know by doing that, it allows us to 
loosen things up so that we can do other things. That to me is like, that speaks to compromise, a strong business compromise. And it's also like, cool. Like it, I think it's like an ethically sound thing, but I like the thought process behind it. Yeah. And that, I, it, and I don't mean to sound uh, cocky about it because there's definitely, you know, there's no guarantee and that even, you know, Girl Biscuits is a small band in the grand scheme of things, but in our universe, it's huge. Mm -hmm. And there's no guarantee that even that um, will keep selling. It's just, I've, I've kind of gotten extra confidence in the last two years because I'm sure you're, you're aware COVID has sort of boosted all online business and, and also our distribution. Adam has done um, an amazing job bringing in labels and stuff that I'm, you know, I may or may not have even heard of some of these records and I'm doing the postage and I was like, we're shipping a hundred of these today, you know, like, um, and so uh, assuming people's interest in records continues, um, I think we will be okay and we won't have to make some hard decisions, but we've gone through slope, you know, Revelation's always been fairly stable and I've been very careful about, uh, you know, almost pathologically cheap and tr in trying to keep costs down. Um, but we, you know, in 2008 was one of the first times we started. So like we, we had uh, that economic downturn and we were negative for a couple of years. And, you know, I wasn't too worried, but I was a little like, all right, maybe we need to cut days or pay, you know, furloughs and all that stuff. And at the first week of COVID, before we knew it was going to be um, a bet, you know, a benefit to some businesses, I was worried we were going to disappear. So we did like, OK, well, everyone's going to work from home or do furloughs until we're allowed to work again. And we did that for a very short period of time before we were allowed, you know, they opened up wholesale and we were allowed to the essential people to come back in the office. Um, all right. I have just a few more questions for you. Is there anything that you want to talk about before we start heading towards the end? Uh, yeah, just congratulations again to, uh, Adam, Greg, Tom for 20 years of, uh, helping and, uh, Check out the new bands that everyone's been working on. Praise, Dare, Be Well, Drain. Um, there's a lot of good stuff that that uh, Adam and Sam and everyone have been putting together. Oh yeah. Um, okay. Um, is there an end to Rev? I don't think so. I mean, I, I'm, my hope is that. Uh, we will, we're going to structure things in a way that will continue with, with, with or without me, you know, like, um, it already functions pretty well. And I think if we, um, made a few small changes, uh, I think it could, it could be an ongoing thing even without, you know, an owner kind of thing. Um, oh, and another person <laughs> I, I really should mention is, uh, Jenny, um, Barley has, um, she's been working at Rev for not 20 years, but a long time. And, um, since, uh, Vic left, uh, has taken on more and more, um, of the kind of time management and uh, off of my plate and production and, and stuff that, that Vic used to do. Um, I had a real hard time once Rainbow went out of business. Rainbow is a pressing plant that that did all our records and CDs for 30 years. And um, when they went out of business, um, it got very chaotic for me. And um, and Jenny has has really helped uh, organize that. She's one of those people that is way way more organized than me, and and has been um, helping keep things going and uh and growing actually oh, yeah. i don't know if you've seen the the records that have been coming in but they're like really they're nicely done and the colors are good and things are going yeah. pretty well i i think current day rev <clears throat> is and i i, I say this i pay this as a compliment and i hope i hope it only comes across the whole crew it's the mo most cohesive i've seen rev in a while i think as you said revs had like up and down periods and I really feel like we're in an up period where there's like a cohesiveness to how things look, how they're coming out, the marketing of it. Um, the bands obviously don't all sound the same, but they make sense being on the same, make sense being on the same record label. Um, 
rev right now feels like kind of like in a in a new spring and it's been really cool to see obviously because it's a great label and it, it means a lot to people but it also feels like it feels like you've got a group of bands and a group of people behind those bands that really care and are pushing and it's nice to see with the label that's got so much history yeah i i'm really happy with the way um adam and you know and jenny does a lot of the marketing too so sam and jenny do a lot together and and uh and adam has been doing all, all of the distribution and picking bands so it's been it's been really good um for you know quite a while but the last two years have been a big boost too all right um another <laughs> tough question but maybe this is an easy question for you uh historically across the whole history of rev were there any releases that you wanted to do that you didn't get to do that actually like you were like ah oh, that really bothered me i didn't get that one um there probably are and i i can't remember there's so many that there's that, that i can't remember them and there's one that we, we used to joke about because the band got so big but um i don't this isn't announced yet but they're going to finally be doing a record on rev like as a you know like for fun and as as a favor to us and it's something that works for them mm -hmm. um so that's kind of cool but i you know I've gone through my demo boxes of stuff that I never got around. Like, I'm going to listen to this. And then I go back and look at it years later. And it's like, good riddance, sent us a demo. <laughs> like, what is wrong with me? Um, but uh, so I can't think of anything specifically um, in the past, really off the top of my head. Um, but I know there is some stuff coming that we missed out on that is going to be big. Um, but you'll, you'll hear about that from another label that we all know and love. So, okay. What's one thing as a business person, and it doesn't have to be leadership, but just as a business person that you really feel good about, like, you're like, yeah, I got this. And it doesn't mean you can't get better at it, but like, what's something as a business person, you're like, I'm really good at that. And then what's something as a business person, you know, you're not good at, and you're constantly trying to get better at it. At least you're putting effort into trying to get better at it. Yeah, it's kind of a boring answer, but I'm really good at cutting costs, find, you know, finding the, uh, the most, uh, you know, I just have like a sense of, I, th I think I have a sense of how to analyze uh, costs uh, pretty well, but that is probably annoying for the people that work with us because they really don't want to think about that, that that shouldn't a lot of people don't think that should be the focus and they're probably right but anyway I, I feel like as a business owner you do have to watch your costs and i feel like i'm pretty good at keeping costs uh down um probably too much mm -hmm. and then um what's the other what's one thing that you know you're not good at oh yeah that's on. time management and yeah. delegation yeah. you know i'm a control freak that moves like the the pace of a snail so bad combo okay but thankfully there are other people that uh work around me they they run circles around me and just uh you keep going jordan <laughs> right, right, right. um and again like dude i, I don't want you to feel like a uh, pinned into a corner on this but just out of interest like you know you you grew up or you came up with hardcore being a huge part of your life and people like evolve and change and they grow um out of the rev catalog are there any three records that you could think of that you actually listen to today? Like you spend time listening to? I listen to, you know, I hear a lot of them because they get played a lot. Um, but I also mean historically any of the ones, like even the ones early releases, like do you ever like throw on like a side by side seven inch kind of thing? Like, yeah. Um, and it's more songs than, than records that strike me. And um, there's a particular side by side song where uh you know it's living a lie mm -hmm. where uh jules yells alex and then this like you know totally trebly guitar comes in and uh i just love you know i love alex and i just love hearing uh you know him get called out on a record and that gorilla biscuit song where you can hear alex's voice that um you know the biscuit power um that's like you know you can hear armand's voice you know like, Armand sang in um, Rest in Pieces. So you, you can hear Ar Armand's voice, but he's in Sick of It All, he's just, you know, always behind the drums. Mm -hmm. So you never hear his voice, but he, you can you can hear Armand on that song too. And Alex and um, a couple other people that you don't, like Luke, I think you can hear his voice. Like Luke never, as far as I know, has never sang in a band. Mm -hmm. You don't hear his voice isolated. Mm -hmm. um, so that's fun. 
thing for me to listen to. But yeah, there, there's a lot of records that I, I put on like, and maybe not on Revelation, but our friends bands, like over the time, I feel like the Quicksand albums have held up so well that like I could see them lasting, like, you know, outside breaking the genre that, that we think of quicksand as like kind of hardcore related, but I, I feel like they are, uh, they're kind of uh, in their own category. Yeah. Um, it unrelated, but like Walter, who's someone I, I just know in passing, but has always been very super kind and really accommodating. Um, there wouldn't be a change LP without Walter, uh, which is a band that I play now. Um, that's a story for another time, but um, kind of gave me some crucial feedback at a time when I really needed it. And then uh, it was cool to be able to send to the record when it was done. So um, yeah, Quicksand, they're, they're a band for the ages, a forever band as I call it. All right, man, well, listen, we're at the end. Uh, first of all, I just want to say something and it's something that made me want to interview you in the first place. Um, you really care about your friends and you really care about like the, the people that you came up with. And it's so, obvious when you talk about it and so when i think about rev i guess the ideas that i had about rev when i was a little kid really seemed to still hold true and just being about like a community of people that look out for each other like care about creating cool things that make a difference and this conversation is that stood out to me again i don't want to put words in your mouth but that's what it's leaving me with um as we're closing off anything that you want to shout out where can people find you look into your stuff rev or anything else you want to share um, yeah, you know, you can always look at Reveille. We don't even have a website now. It's just our online store. But, um, you know, social media, we have some posts and all the usual places. Um, yeah, um, thanks for that. Yeah, I I, um, I don't talk to Ray as often as I, I would like to because he's super busy. But mm -hmm. I do every time I, I hear him talking on one of his podcasts or posts, it's like, guy's great. So yeah, I, I do hope you get to interview him. That would be uh, that. It, listening to your previous episode, it, it seems like it would fit well with the kinds of things you talk about. You know, well, I just appreciate you coming on because I know you're a little hesitant, and uh, I just <clears throat> you're awesome, man. This was a very very cool conversation and super meaningful for me that you're here. So thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so uh, everyone, I'll see you in the outro. And Spencer, drop the beat. That was a cool conversation. You know, it's it's an interesting thing growing up in a scene that is like this weird microcosm. It's big, like there's thousands of people into it across the world, but it, it is still relatively small if you think about how big the world is. So you grow up in this little scene and there are things to you that that inform how you engage in things. And I guess like the, the way I talk about it is like, Walking around in a Youth of Today shirt made me feel like a little bit less alone as a kid. The same way walking around in like a Pal Peralta shirt would make me feel, or the same way that walking around in a Minor Threat shirt would make me feel. Like that kind of thing where it's like a secret thing that you and your friends believe in that gives you a guiding light in the distance. And so it, talking to someone like Jordan and talking about like the business side of it is interesting to me because yeah, like I, I care about how businesses are run and I want to bring that up. And I love that idea that like leadership doesn't always have to be this super like I'm the leader active space that you can actually just be more in the background and that you can surround yourself with people who are willing to put their hands in the wheel and you just guide from the background and just put those right people in, in, the, in the space. Rev success over the years is like um, without question, in my opinion, their cultural impact huge and their ability to still pull out like super cool relevant bands now is amazing. So if there's anything I want people to, to take away is you don't have to have some grand vision. You don't have to have like, this like I'm taking the leap. I know exactly what I'm doing. You can do what I think Jordan said so beautifully is let the work guide you, let the ideas guide you, let the relationships guide you. And eventually you can build up something that serves a community that, that makes a difference. And you can do it just by following, um, by following the work. So with that, everyone, uh, if you haven't yet, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. And we'll see you next time. I'm Aram Arslanian, and this is One Step Beyond. One Step